public access. Yeah. You know, I think there's a, the hope of the world is in public access communication. That's my humble opinion. But your book is a second light uh, candle in the dark, it seemed to me, and I congratulate you enormously. Thank you. Really Thank good. Thank you very much. And welcome, welcome very much <coughs> to Conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program uh, Ray, Raymond or Ray Carey. And he's a, a business man, and he's also an economic philosopher, particularly in the more recent years. And he's written a book. You can see it here very well. Let me show it. Uh, it's called, I want to show this right at the outset, and we come in on it during the program. But it's called Democratic Capitalism. And what's the subtitle, Ray? The Way to a World of Peace and Plenty. Not pretentious at all. Not at all pretentious, but I think that's a good idea. I think we could all agree that that's a really very good idea. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that might be your grandchild, your grandson. That uh, is my grandson, Kelly. Good idea. And I thought the whole thing was full of symbolism until his mother told me that he was trying to decide whether he could eat the tulips. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they wonderful? You have six, I guess, right? Six, right. Grandchildren? Yeah. I got four. It sure does change your thinking and everything. Yes. You get a generational context. But anyway, th welcome very much to Conversations and Manhattan Network. And I wonder if you could, we do it here, Ray, could you share a little bit of your background? And your background, I've been through your bio, it's so rich, we can't go over it all, but in a highlighting kind of way. Uh, born and raised <coughs> education a little bit, and then we want to get into the sub and substance of your economic philosophy and your take on the world because it's a uh, it's very positive, uh, realistically positive. And uh, but could you share your own background, please? Sure. Grew up in Gardner, Massachusetts, which is North Central Massachusetts. Uh, deep roots in Gardner. My mother and dad went to the same high school. My grandfathers went to the same high school. Beautiful. <coughs> in the Navy for a couple of years at the end of World War II, Holy Cross, uh, 1948. You were an officer in the Navy? No. no. I, <coughs> I was an uh, officer training, but I ended up in the uh, very elevated assignment of the uh, compartment cleaner. Oh, department cleaner? Well, compartment okay. cleaner. Yeah, well, it's like the, med, the, so the, uh, you know, the spear thrower is, uh, holders in the opera all serve right. and so forth, and then everybody <coughs> serves in that. And but then, I know uh, you did have some association or some association with Mr. Rickover, I think, at one point, or at least the elements that were evolving okay. around that. Well, man. I went to Harvard Business School, and then when I was a swing shift foreman, and then uh, at the Electric Boat Division of General Dynamics, I was the assistant to the nuclear, very ele elegant title, nuclear projects coordinator. Mm -hmm. But this was from the time of laying the keel on the Nautilus, and uh, one of my many assignments was running the shows down in Siberia and Admiral Rickover would be a regular visitor with the people from Congress and things of that type. That was a major <coughs> development in terms of uh, technology, the nuclear submarine, was it not? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <coughs> I also had the incredible opportunity to go down to Westinghouse Atomic Power Division every few weeks mm -hmm. and sit in on there. <coughs> progress meetings and you could just see the genius of Admiral Rickover because mm -hmm. the, if you let the engineers alone, they'd say, give me five times the money, five times the time, yes. and I'll give you a breadboard, maybe. Yes, but yes. They were under the gun and had to come up with a <coughs> practical working model uh, in a matter of weeks. He, he felt a great uh, need for that under the geostrategic uh, and geopolitical context of the time, right? Yeah, no question. Uh -huh. <coughs> it, it was sort of like the space program or something in a way, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that, <coughs> that's the good news and the bad news. Yes. <coughs> like I stayed with General Dynamics and I was the plant manager <coughs> at the young age of 28 in Bayonne, New Jersey, of a, a very unsuccessful motor company that, with the help of uh, Harris Shapiro, the genius designer that I uh, got lucky to have, we. Uh, took the company and made a huge success out of it. <coughs> and I think one of the experiences at Electrodynamic that uh, helped me all of my working career and helped me in my philosophy, mm -hmm. we lost the whole company after spending years building it up that uh, burnt down in a fire in Yes, I, was tra I read it was tragic. Oh, the whole oh, 14 buildings, 17, 14 buildings <coughs> all burned to the ground. Even the even yeah. the records that you had saved that got burned in the vaults exactly. and whatnot. It was a real exactly. downer, as they <coughs> say. So we met at my home in Rumson, New Jersey, the following Sunday morning. 
and kind of looked at each other and said, how do you, how do you rebuild it? Uh, so we did, but when I uh, use the expression economic common purpose, mm -hmm. I've been there. I, yeah. I saw what because you, you, could do. Uh, you, I read that in your book. You had a real team of people who worked as a team and there was inter oh, because absolutely. it's the design and then it's the marketing and everything is like a synergistic whole and they work <coughs> together and that's one of the marks of the kind of management you wanted to encourage. Exactly. Huh? Uh -huh. But we had to put it back together again fast enough to not <coughs> go out of business uh, you know, because of the, the huge costs. And that was one of my more nervous moments was appearing in the Rockefeller Center at the General Dynamics board meeting to in the big building at yeah, Rock Thirty Rock, right? Right. Uh, that's the big. That's the big them to <laughs> Convince them to, you know, put the money back into Electrodynamic, which fortunately I did. And there'd been some contacts with Congress and whatnot over that, I think. Yes. And so that might have been the context, political and business context. Well, that that <coughs> realistically, uh, we had done such a good job with low noise motors that there was no way that big general dynamics was going to pull the plug on a very important part of the program. Uh -huh. And one of the greatest compliments that we ever had was <coughs> Admiral Rickover putting out an edict to use interim motors from companies like GE or Westinghouse until Electro got dynamic got back in business. So that uh -huh. was an experience. How long did it take you to get it back in <coughs> the swing of things? Well, we were <coughs> we were producing and shipping the the fire was in April. We were producing and shipping at a new plant in Avonel by that fall. Wow, that's pretty fast. Yeah. That's a quick turnaround. But, but, uh, it's amazing <laughs> what uh, support and backing can do for an uh, enterprise. Well, it's the, <coughs> the lesson <coughs> that was so profound just to see what people could do. You know, some of the buzzwords of business decentralization and uh -huh. empowerment. Uh -huh. I didn't have any choice. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, yeah, got to flip it out and say, you know, sick them, Ralphie, you run with this. And right. It's got an entrepreneurial ring to it in oh, a way that is really all and good. they entrepreneurs and spirit. Uh -huh. but, but they, it was just such an, an incredible performance. <coughs> but then you, you look at the experience and say that is the way industry should run. That's the way other elements of society should run. Perhaps society why, itself should run. Yes, but why... <coughs> is the only time when we seem to get common purpose uh -huh. is when we're war. going to war. Oh. I mean, it's a it's the social paradox. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. That is interesting, isn't it? it is. Yes. You get pulled, and then even when you're going to war, if I may, even when you're going to war, the war we I barely remember the Second War. The country was really Rosie the Riveter, and everyone oh. was involved <coughs> in that, and there was universal, you know, fight the fascists, that kind of thing. But then since then, after uh, Korea even, and then Vietnam, uh, things got a little bit different. So the war became a source of great division. War now is a source of great division in the minds of lots of people. You know, so that's a, that's a dynamic that doesn't hold universally even there in the terms of time <coughs> of so-called war. The mm. nation can be divided like we are now over Iraq, for instance. But I, I can make an argument that yeah. every war was a product of you know, stupid mistakes uh, World War II <coughs> could be traced back to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, <coughs> in my chapter 10 of my book, hypothesis yeah. number one is that if you want, wonder why the world is full of folly and violence, it's huh. because we've started at the wrong place. You've got to start with the economic system that can feed, shelter, clothe, educate, provide good health. And the best example of not doing that is Woodrow Wilson at the 1919 peace talks. Versailles. And all he's interested in is a political solution. And his own biographer said he had absolutely no interest in economics and the reparations agreement <coughs> was so disastrous. And John Maynard Keynes was on the British team. Yeah, he was, okay, and, yeah. Uh -huh. And he, he bolted in anger. Uh -huh. He couldn't believe anybody was that ignorant of economics. Yeah. And went home and wrote uh, the general theory. No, he wrote oh. the uh, economic con consequences, consequences of the, of the peace, peace process. Yeah, right. yeah. So you, uh, you know, any of these things could be uh, highly debated by many, but uh, <coughs> I think you could trace World War II to that particular era, uh, that in 1919. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but going back to the background, uh, yeah. af after I uh, 
left General Dynamics. I was with a Canadian company for a couple of years, and then uh, I went into ADT for and spent 18 years there. What did the ADT stand for? American District Telegraph. They okay. Actu there actually were, <coughs> before the phone, uh -huh. there were Telegraph. telegraphs. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Marconi. Fire, yeah. police, yeah. give me a keg of beer, you know, uh -huh. whatever the urgent, r urgent need was. Yeah. Uh, ADT went way back. But when it I did, went it went back. Uh, uh, how, do you know how many? I mean, you probably do. How many? When oh, did it, yeah, what were the roots, the seminal oh, roots? Oh, it's of well it? over 100 years. 100? Uh, that's going yeah. way back from when yeah. you joined, you mean? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So that goes back into the 19th century. Oh, sure. Uh huh. <coughs> but I had just recently uh, <coughs> been spun off of Grinnell uh, in a famous antitrust action, and they were pretty shook up with that whole thing. And, uh, yeah, and it was just at the time when the microprocessor was absolutely. coming out. You see, so the microprocessor changed everything. Yeah, absolutely Not only your did. business, but the whole damn world exactly. got changed with the micro. And it's still reeling under the uh, influence of dynamic, yeah. exponential increase in capability in terms of uh, no communication question. technology, don't you think? Yes. We're absolutely. coming up to nanotechnology yeah. now. Yeah. It's staggering. But anyway, yeah. Well, at, I think at ATT, <coughs> my proudest moment, which I tried to do at Electrodynamic, but wasn't able to do it, but my proudest moment was designing and putting in place a uh, employee profit-sharing ownership plan. Good what, for you. <laughs> good for you, sir. That was really good. It wasn't, okay, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. Hmm. But uh, <coughs> I like the, the name of it. We ran a contest to name it. And some lady in the Detroit office said, as I understand it, the more we care, the more we have to share. Why don't you name it Care and Share? And we said, well, that's, that's, that, a, that's, that's a winner. That's a that's winner. A, that's a, exactly. Anybody on Madison Avenue would say, yeah. go with that. That's <laughs> b yeah. So that, this was the kind of plan that, <coughs> you know, there are many, many good plans, ESOPs and, and other types, uh, but this one, the people really had a feeling of ownership because they had to put money into the plan. There was okay, a payroll, they, payroll they, deduction. Uh, payroll not, deduction, okay. You know, it came right out of their pay, so. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. It, was, it, it wasn't an, an elitist plan. Everybody in the company was eligible in, in most of the countries. Voluntary? <laughs> Voluntary, uh, uh -huh. <coughs> and from day one of employment. Uh, uh -huh. And we had you know, comfortably over 60% participation and Pretty considering good. the fact that uh, there was, they had to put money into it. Uh -huh. Then the company matched on performance a minimum of 20 cents on the dollar and up to as much as a dollar for dollar. And <coughs> what, what, what caused the difference in ratio, 20 to a dollar? It would well. be how, how well the imp earnings improved. Oh, okay. It was linked to improvement. Okay, right. it's linked yep. to growth. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because that incur. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, now who had who had designed that? Had you designed it, or yes. did somebody help you design it? Bankers? Well, or? yeah. Bob Donnelly, our vice president of legal counsel, uh, helped me. But uh, <coughs> it, it's not <coughs> mm -hmm. it's not very complicated. You see, people. If you want people to be motivated mm -hmm. and to function to their full potential, then they have to. Uh, have a share in the uh, improvement that they've created. Mm. Uh, that's that's about that simple. So a lot uh, of people have not had that. Mm. I mean, they would have, uh, they would have just their wages. I mean, they would get wages for their labor, and then that was it. And mm -hmm. they didn't have any ownership in the ongoing company itself. And in fact, I think uh, that's that's something that you really question in terms of. I think you use the term ultra capitalism. Maybe that's another issue. Mm -hmm. But that's been a characteristic <laughs> of a lot of the robber baron period and a lot of period out of history. Were there many other examples that you repaired to when you were putting that uh, profit sharing system in place? I mean, what were some? Were there precursors to what you did, or ones that you took study well, from? And because <coughs> we're looking for a template, and then mm -hmm. there's. Then there came ERISA and other kinds of things. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what the nation's been able to put together collectively in, on that issue of somehow bringing the, the people in on ownership of the economy. Well, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh -huh. yeah, I think there was a, <coughs> people have been <coughs> reinventing the benefits of ownership uh, <coughs> you know, for 150 years or longer. <coughs> uh, 
John Stuart Mill. Yeah. Uh, most people have read his work on on liberty, mm -hmm. abstract theory. Giant <coughs> mind. But Giant. very few people have mm -hmm. read his chapter on the probable futurity of the working class. Probable what? Futurity. Or futurity. The, yeah. yeah. Okay. Would you mind if I read what John Stuart Mill said? Not at all. Pull it out. Pull it. I'd, I'd be happy to hear John Stuart Mill ever. He was one of the great voices in but the history the, of mankind. The, the problem, in my opinion, uh -huh. <coughs> is that you have to start with the economic system, and he knew what it was. He absorbed. Thank you. He he absorbed all of Marx's visions, uh -huh. and Marx didn't have a clue what to do with them. But he did have the visions that you he start did. with the individual. Full development of each is the condition for the full development of all. Yeah. Change the work culture from alienation to cooperation. Uh -huh. Give people an ownership participation, and Marx. Marx. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ownership within a context of a private corporate well, structure. That, uh, that's where he got fatigued. Yeah. He, he didn't carry it through. It that's was, kind of a biggie. Was, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, uh -huh. And that's why Marxism contradicted all of the good parts of Marx. Uh, mm -hmm. So he, but Marx had never been in a factory. He 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 got his information. Never met a from, payroll. Never made a he never, he, hardly, he hardly had enough to eat, poor fellow, with got, the, well, the got, museum. He, he got a lot of help from his friend Ingalls, including yeah. opinions on what was going on. And didn't Asian a lot Spikers. of the philosophy, uh, didn't that, they, they used to talk about pol uh, yeah, political economy within the 19th century term, where they tried to blend, or remember he did, or some did, the politics. So you brought up the politics as opposed to economics. I agree with economics, it begins with that. It's a grounding thing yes. in terms of informing the whole <laughs> process, and it's not got adequate attention given to it. But isn't wasn't that a characteristic of much of the thinking of some of our major so-called econom economics or more well, comprehensive people who were thinking about the social condition? I think my my hang-up is I think yeah. there's been a myopia from the time of Adam Smith okay. on the part of the intellectual community mm -hmm. <coughs> who did <coughs> to get fancy about it, yeah. they've been culturally conditioned ever since Plato okay. to have a contempt for commerce. Uh -huh. And that's carried through, uh, <coughs> you know, the aristocracy uh, couldn't work. That was a demeaning thing. Mm -hmm. Plato said, uh, <coughs> we got to keep the commercial class as small as possible so their corruption will not inf infect the rest of society. Is that right? You uh, said that, right? Yeah. And Pla and uh -huh. Aristotle, who the philosopher of common sense, so mm -hmm. I like so much of what he did, but you're more Aristotelian, he, are you? Yeah, more yeah. Than Plato, right? But uh. Aristotle was piling on too, and uh. he found a law in Thebes that said a person who had been selling in the marketplace couldn't work in the state for ten years after retirement. I mean, that was the that was the cultural <laughs> that conditioning. Was that, that, that's like worse than a security <laughs> thing, where you can't go out of the country yeah. if you had certain security clearances. Yeah, but that's why I keep drumming on this yes. uh, starting point. Good for you. It should be drummed upon. I agree with you completely yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I doubt if you could find one academician out of a hundred who, uh, <coughs> who has studied this particular part of Mill's work. Uh huh. It was. You yeah, know, I was surprised to see him surface in your book so prominently. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I was happily surprised. Yeah. 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 But mm -hmm. yeah, nice symmetry. 1776. Adam Smith published. Wealth of Nations and the and steam the declaration, engine. Declaration of Independence. And the steam, the steam engine, engine was invented at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right. which was changing the economics exactly. in a major way. Yeah. Mm. 1848, Communist Manifesto and Mill's Principles of Political Economy. There was a whole lot of revolution going yeah. on in Europe in 1848, too. <coughs> Mill mm. had all kinds of examples of ownership and uh -huh. how well it worked you know, mm. going back. He says, the other mode in which cooperation tends still more efficaciously to increase the productiveness of labor consists in the vast stimulus given to productive energies by placing the laborer as a mass in a relation to their work, which would make it their principal and their interest at present it is neither, to do the utmost instead of the least possible in exchange for their remuneration. It is scarcely possible to rate too highly this material benefit which yet is nothing compared to the moral revolution in society that would accompany it, a new sense of security and independence in the laboring class, and the conversion of each human being's daily occupation 
into a school of the social sympathies and the practical intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now he he's put a lot together there. The yeah, I tell you, there's a lot in there. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Scarcity, yeah. The elevation of uh, spirits, <coughs> and a basic moral system. And the, and the significance of a sense of ownership on the part mm -hmm. of the people involved in the enterprise. And yes. there's a there's a there's a saying nobody ever went to uh, great lengths to defend. Uh, nobody ever went to great lengths to wash a rented car. <laughs> but if right. you have you have an ownership stake in it, you have a different right. attitude toward it right. and that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, not enough of that has been characteristic of the uh, economy writ large and so forth in your view. You're, you say democratic capitalism, you're in a sense making a plea that we really tap into the full dynamics of what a real democratic capitalism would be uh, without necessarily saying everything's hunky-dory now. There's changes that could be made, but that that you want to, you that's the theme of your your book. Some people would say democratic capitalism is an oxymoron oh, uh, because capitalism <coughs> means that a few people own everybody and everybody's a wage slave and that kind of yeah. thing. I guess you're aware that's of a, that thing. That's, that's a going popular around. expression which I've I have received from many professors, uh, <coughs> and my response is. Uh, <coughs> Go back and do your homework. Okay. There's, there's well. a conflict in capitalism, and as long as the intellectual community takes this, pardon the expression, smug attitude uh -huh. about <laughs> generic capitalism, uh -huh. it does not get in some depth to study the different forms of capitalism. Uh -huh. We will continue to end up with the wrong people logging okay. the rules and writing writing the wrong wrong rules for the system. Uh-huh, okay. <coughs> where, where are the good, uh, what is the good track, the good capitalist, the good track in terms of the capitalist development, and what is posited against it qualitatively? The socialist critique does not hold. Uh, uh, Mr. Fukuyama wrote a book, The End of History, The Last Man, in a certain sense, that we defeated, or it imploded, the Soviet Union, which was a massive socialist thing, China seems to have been guided by Mao's book and a Western Marxian analysis of things. It was Marx that was being interpreted and so on like that. Seems to have been uh, co-opted or brought into the fold and so forth. But what are the trends that you see that are of uh, capitalism in its development? If we're, if we're left without the Soviet Union and that thing, what are the uh, characteristics I, I, we, we're left with a capitalist model, and uh, there's not a quantitative or qualitative challenge to the capitalist model or its interpretations within that paradigm, which are those that are representing legitimately the march of history forward, or how do you see that in a large question? <coughs> well, I think uh, <coughs> the criticism of capitalism, market fundamentalism, globalization, I think all go back to a lack of understanding of what Adam Smith said. Adam Smith, as you know, was a professor <coughs> of moral th philosophy yes, he was a moral before philosopher. he yeah. wrote Wealth of Nations, mm -hmm. spent several years in France, benefited from uh, the physiocrats mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, and, and the uh, Enlightenment. But he had two conditions, uh, three as a matter of fact, in his uh, <coughs> Nothing is required to take a nation from barbaric conditions to great opulence other than peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of, <coughs> uh, of the government. Okay. But he said <coughs> money has to be neutral, meaning it can't influence the process. It's got to be a simple medium of exchange, and we have to keep the speculators prodigals and projectors, as he called them, under control. I don't think we've necessarily done that. So you think we've no. done that well? No. We've, uh, we've it seems to me. We've yeah. contradicted Smith's conditions in uh, the extreme. Right, in extreme. Pretty much, yeah. pretty much from the beginning uh -huh. and never worse uh -huh. than right now. Uh -huh. I mean, when, when there is $2 trillion a day traded on the uh, world's electronic currency casino. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. It's In a, a world where the entire GDP of the world is like $35 trillion, uh -huh. $2 trillion a day. Yeah, so a day. Yeah. Money is not 
neutral, and then you look at everything else going on right now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mon money talks. Yeah, it, it overwhelms the system. So we Greg Pallas says it's the best democracy money can buy. <laughs> you know, he's got a, that's a, a sort of sa mm -hmm. non, non sanguine look at things. Yeah. yeah, right. You sort of share that, right? Yes. That we've gone astray. Well, I we could do well to repair to Mr. Smith of her basic premises if, and grounding if principles? We, or? If we follow the conditions, and I think if we, <coughs> at, you know, Marx and Mill came 75 years later and then they were like an audit of the capitalism of Smith and they made their important additions, uh, particularly the whole ownership concept where <coughs> if people are motivated, you're gonna create more wealth and if they're participants in the ownership, it's automatically distributed. You're mm -hmm. not in a condition like today mm -hmm. where the, uh, <coughs> you mentioned ERISA, the uh, ERISA, yeah. ERISA, mm -hmm. the pension and uh, funding. When that came in, Congress- We're talking now about when? 1974, I believe. 74, yeah. They took about 10 years to write it. Uh, Stuart. Robert Monks was involved in that. Yeah. Robert A.J. Monks. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, yeah. I knew he was a great shareholder activist. Yeah, uh -huh. anyway, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the, the idea was that uh, you, you can't stiff the pensioners the way Studebaker did when they went broke, mm -hmm. so they wrote this plan. And what they did is they actually extracted cash from companies that had been previously used for dividends and growth. Uh, companies at that time probably were only cash funding their pension obligation uh, at a rate of about 25 percent. Okay. They okay. were charging against earnings uh -huh. the full amount. So all of a sudden, as much as 100 billion a year savings is looking f for investment. Uh -huh. it, was the, it was the greatest savings investment opportunity in the history of Are those capitalism. like retained earnings then? That there, is that it would was, be retained? Was cash. No. Yeah, okay. It was, it was, but a lot of people don't realize I was taken out of companies, but what happened is instead of designing the plan- And invested on a crapshoot. <coughs> there were two questions. Yeah. Where's the money gonna go and how's, how much is it gonna cost to get there? Uh -huh. And I think the, the huge error <coughs> was the assumption that the stock market was an effective uh, medium- Money machine. To take hmm. the savings and to invest, put it into job growth investment, which would only be done by issuing, uh, companies issuing new equities and taking the money to grow the company. Uh -huh. uh, <coughs> most of it slowed down and didn't make that transfer and helped push the market up. And we're now at a point that uh, that perversion has gone to an extreme that I think is hard to believe. The stock market last year had $585 billion more taken out in stock buybacks and takeovers than it issued a new stock. Is that a fact? Yeah. Uh. So the whole stock market is shrinking. And uh. somebody say, why is the market going up? So check your book on supply and demand. The money's still pouring in uh -huh. from pension funding. Uh -huh. And if the supply of stock is shrinking, you know, what do you suppose is gonna happen? Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. But the, uh, <coughs> the other bad part of that pattern was the, <coughs> uh, the directors of companies were kind of shook up by the threatening language of the plan, so they were looking for maximum insulation, which meant layers of money managers deciding where they would invest that money. And Did it, all that swaps and derivatives come out of that mm, concern, or is, is eventually? It, but this was this was or before this that. This was simpler times. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, that thing gets really Byzantine, you yeah. know. But anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take yeah. you astray. Yeah. No, but the uh, <coughs> I think it's a critical part of the conflict in capitalism now. This was this was not a conspiracy, but the money managers very quickly were measured by the companies on quarterly and annual performance. Uh -huh. They were all ranked on the Becker medium and they were fighting for first place because that's how you got more business. But had, they, it, had, it, had there always been a tendency in that direction throughout the economic history of things or had it reached a new dimension? What made it new computer possibility? What made really, it so that it I, became so I think there was so much, liqui think? so much liquidity, liquidity okay, coming yeah. out of the pension funding uh -huh. that it gave <coughs> the stock market and the analysts the clout to start uh, affecting how companies 
ran their business. But what happens if they invest in something and it's like a crapshoot and the thing comes up snake eyes? I mean, mm. what happens to the investment, the retirement funds and that sort of thing if they're betting them in the market like that, if, they're, if they lose? Uh, what do you mean, if they bought, bought their own stock or what? No, if they bought, if they made an investment that was going to not be one that was prudent and growth and steady and so forth, made bad investment decisions well, and the <coughs> invest they they were in they were investing um, retirement funds, mm -hmm. <coughs> but nothing simple. It was the original, uh, <coughs> you know, fixed fixed benefit plan. Okay. They pay the pension benefit anyway, but then they uh, <coughs> converted a lot of those to a co contributory plan. But I think the the point I want to make is that companies started getting so oriented to quarterly earnings yeah, <coughs> okay, yeah. that they would go and cash in future programs to hype the short-term earnings. Uh -huh. And that's been going on for a quarter century. And they could, see, they could see, what I don't know, arbitrage or some sort of advantage to that where they're going to get a better window on better, the future. Better stock price and uh -huh. more money on the options, uh, unfortunately. Some of that went on when the Enron thing, do you think? <coughs> or, or was that in a league by itself? In a well, sense? In Enron, you're beginning to get into the derivatives and the futures trading. Yeah. Uh, I have a chapter in my book on Enron, and I think if... Uh, <coughs> Is it printable? Is it uh, pronounceable on television, the <laughs> words and the adjective used? Or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it was a... You know, anybody been looking, mm. year after year, their margins were going down and their mm. debt was going up, mm -hmm. and they had that <coughs> they had that ability uh, that uh, comes with derivatives to, uh, if they're having a poor quarter, the word would go out to crank the dials. Mm -hmm. Crank the dials meant you go and look at some of those future contracts, and mm -hmm. beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Decide yeah. Uh -huh. that they're a little bit better than the last time you looked, uh -huh. and all of a sudden Is you have some earnings pick up in that quarter. Yeah, uh, they're also used, I, I've talked to some banking friends and so forth, there's certain things like on currency fluctuations, that kind of thing. It's, it's a bet against, or a hedge against um, risk. Uh, bankers would say, if you don't have a clause in there, a derivative clause or something, you could be sued for malpractice if you're not taking account of this risk aversion capability of derivatives and swaps made available and so forth. So it's a, it's a technique for dealing with risk, which I guess <coughs> a lot of the business enterprise and the banking is about trying to deal with the potential risk and so forth, isn't it? And some, yes. are, some are safer and more steady, and others are more risky uh, right on up into mm -hmm. venture, I guess, mm -hmm. or something. I don't know. I'm looking for a kind of pattern that is there throughout the economy. Well, that, <coughs> there's a legitimate argument that it, there's a discipline there. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's an opportunity to hedge the, they they hedge derivatives on to derivatives to derivatives now. Yeah. Uh, but the, you look at what happened to the so-called subprime loans. Mm -hmm. You know the <coughs> the least financially sophisticated people were seduced into taking ho home mortgages, but the <coughs> the loans were bundled, passed on, converted into derivatives, mm -hmm. and by the time the thing finishes. Right now, there are so many layers between the loan and the person that's holding the loan that the old banker's judgment of uh, you know, yeah. how well are they going to be able to pay that. <laughs> yeah, with the, that, all, the, all the feasibility studies sort of get lost in the shuffle or something that, like that. That, that uh. shoe hasn't finished dropping either because uh. an awful lot of uh, those floating rate loans that are going to be reset in the next 18 months. Yeah, it's been quite a, it's been quite a ride. And you were involved always, and back to that thing, you, you, you spoke about, um, you know, ESOPs, you brought that up. We're both familiar with Lewis Kelso. Mm -hmm. We both know way back a grand fellow, Norman Curlin, mm -hmm. who's down the Center for Social and Economic, right. Ju Economic and Social Justice at, in Washington. And he was associated, Jeff Gates, associated with Lewis Kelso. I guess you, you, you got a chapter in there about his contributions and so forth. Maybe we could address that, where it fits in on this ownership thing, maybe tied into Mill's view of things and so forth. The <coughs> ESOP, and then he had a number of other things that were done there for about 12 years or so. There were legislation that was encouraging 
generally in a general pattern they were encouraging ownership opportunities for the general citizenry that had not been adequately available to them right right and the context within which that could be realized within an economy so they'd have an alternate way of being involved on the ownership and that could also be an alternate way for distributing income other than just strictly labor participation in yes. the process it is it's that a, a summary that's a, a good summary okay if if you did a historical picture adam smith was talking about involved people in high wages from uh -huh. the beginning yeah because his dynamic motivated people motivated involved. yeah people right uh -huh. Uh -huh. because his dynamic of spreading wealth around the world depended on volume uh -huh. the volume the cost and with competition the price went down mm -hmm. more people could afford to buy that added more volume and you had a perpetual motion machine running uh -huh. within the economics mm -hmm. then mill and marx added the ownership motivation of why not have the people have a piece of the action yeah <coughs> mr Tr mr long used to talk about that all the time russell well, long was some finance chairman yeah right and his but daddy was huey long right you saw every man a king yeah and uh, yeah okay yeah but i before russell long back in uh, the, the around 1920 uh -huh. there was huge interest on part on the part of CEOs and on the part of uh, politicians uh -huh. in ownership, and there were really there were is that quite, right? There was a, a, a significant number of, of tax laws passed, uh -huh. and that's that's key to help support the system. And then, of course, Russell Long, uh, with the uh, encouragement of Kelso and Curlin and Jeff Gates and others, uh, mm -hmm. became a, an evangelist for worker ownership and yeah, passed. And 13 or 15 laws for benefiting ESOPs. And the eco economics profession zeroed in on him with laser beam animosity, mm. I think, because Mr. Samuelson said it's a crankish fad. Mm. Let them eat stock. That kind <laughs> of a statement that this is something that doesn't comport with the basic premises of economics itself. You know, there have to be something different blowing in the wind, as Bobby Dylan said, in order to make way for such a thing. And there was a reaction against it, I think, don't you think? It's still yes. there, but there <coughs> are, you know. But I, I was very depressed to see what happened after 1990 because I, I think of this whole question of uh, the way to a world of peace and plenty. Yes. With the demise of communism, mm -hmm. I think we were very close. The, countries were moving towards economic freedom in Eastern Europe, South America, Southeast Asia. <coughs> and I think uh, <coughs> the information age demanded a work culture of this type. And well, okay, I could come back to that maybe. Yeah, well, I, I say that because uh -huh. the, their, their prime resource was the cognitive power of their people. And if uh -huh. the people were not motivated and involved <coughs> uh, they wouldn't be successful. Could I introduce a thought here now? This is from Lord Keynes. I mentioned to you off camera and so forth, and I've got this article that Mr. Keynes put together in 1930. He wrote an article to his grandchildren. I'll get a copy of it to you. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, that would be now. They're coming into their own now. Uh, that uh, we are going to be confronted with something that's hard to imagine now in terms of the trendings of the world trendings and everything. And that's going to be technologically induced unemployment by our finding technological systems that can be productive without the <coughs> labor input to the process. And one of Lewis Kelso's charts shows the input to production through time increasingly something more than human labor. So I'm not sure everything is to be seen through the labor criteria uh, as we tend to do. It's very convenient the way we organize things. But the, the ownership of something other than labor, like technology, or you have automated systems that operate tremendously productively without any, once they're up and running, there's no labor input to it. I mean, switching systems and so forth. I just want to introduce that concept. Beyond outsourcing and beyond that, there is the displacement of labor. And if that is the case, we distribute all income to the mass of the people through labor. We tax that in order to put it into some time, but it's ultimately going through labor. 
while the technology is more and more re responsible in a realistic sense with production, and the product th that is owned by a relatively small group, and it isn't thought of as a way of distributing income, a serious way of distributing income beyond pensions and so forth, or the capital, uh, the, 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 the capital formation capability that such a, a, a general theory or general system could provide for us to do what we're technologically capable of doing. We have a capability of providing an unutilized capability, a huge unutilized capability, because there's not sufficient market demand on the part of the people who are tied only to labor in order to buy which can be produced, can be done. So the, the, the growth potential of a well work, a well organized system is one that is brought into question, I think, by a lot of what Lewis said and so forth. You get a binary, you get a growth. If the people, you have to have some way of distributing income other than through labor criteria, which is the basis of most political economies in the world now. Just a thought. Well, uh, I mean, can <coughs> you, you know, maybe we're going to have to have some leisure, and maybe we're going to have to have some allow technology to take over things and not be in a in a competition with technology that is effectively superseding the labor input to the productive process, the labor theory like of value. I don't ag agree with okay. Keynes' theory on that at all. And, okay. uh, witness the United States. We've hmm. already gone from probably 45% down under 10 in terms of manufacturing, labor-intensive work, <coughs> and we got a 4% unemployment. Uh, <coughs> hmm. And you look at the world from the time of Adam Smith, <coughs> there's a system there, <coughs> excuse me, that has a capability of eliminating material scarcity. Wait a minute, what has, an, what has the capability of eliminating the, uh, scarcity? Free market system. Free market system, okay, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Um, and uh -huh. there are still uh -huh. two billion people in the world trying to live on two dollars a day. <coughs> I know, and there's a lot of them trying to live on a dollar a day, and how the hell can anybody live on a dollar a day? You, you, you can't. cannot. But those, you know, the, you can be <coughs> either depressed or if you're an optimist like I am, you say, well, if you get it right, you saw China and India take 500 million people out of extreme poverty. Between the two of a them. a decade between the two of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, they've left a lot in done. poverty. They've left a lot well, in no poverty. Question. Yeah. No question. No question. Uh, and you, you've still got half the population living on $2 a day. M Mr. T Coffee Annan tells us that not half the population of the world has never made a telephone call. Mm -hmm. Pretty staggering <coughs> yeah. in terms of getting the capability. We have a capability that our system doesn't allow us to do in terms of a systems involving of the whole of the human society. It seems to me, you don't, you, but you, you see the glass half full or three quarters full um, <coughs> in terms of the trends. I see the free market system that gets <coughs> such criticism by people that, uh, in my judgment, should spend more time studying the alternatives within capitalism, and particularly studying Adam Smith's two conditions, neutral money uh -huh. and control of the speculators. That uh -huh. was later rephrased of control, currency, and credit for the general welfare. Uh -huh. we, don't, we control well, it for the speculators. Was that Teddy Roosevelt, or who yeah. was that? It, I'd like to say it was in the Constitution, but I checked once and it really isn't. So oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. But that's kind of a general feeling of uh. the financial obligation. Uh -huh. <coughs> but I, <coughs> I think that uh, <coughs> the whole world was moving in this direction back in the, after the demise of communism and the information age had a unifying effect, the communication opportunities. And I think uh, <coughs> Fukuyama's book came out and was severely criticized and of course after 9-11 People were somewhat gleeful in, in pointing out that 9-11 just destroyed his theory, which it didn't at all. He yeah. gave a very good answer uh -huh. that <coughs> this huge urge towards freedom, which I uh -huh. think has been the motive force of everything that's gone on in human history. Okay. And it's uh -huh. just a question of how it's impeded or how it's encouraged. Uh -huh. <coughs> but that will affect all cultures, including the Muslim culture. And I think we've... Uh, We've institutionalized this idea of the terrorists attacking us, and a <coughs> not exactly a wild 
left-wing document, but the uh, the Cato is a well-regarded think tank, mm -hmm. libertarian in politics. Libertarian, yeah. Uh, <coughs> and they did a paper that said every single terrorist action was in response to the United States primarily, but other countries invading sovereign territory of Muslim countries. Well, uh, most <coughs> people get upset when their country is invaded. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know. Mm. Well, 5,700 yeah. 5, troops you know, billeted not that far from Mecca in Saudi Arabia yeah, yeah, after yeah. the first Iraq war uh -huh. uh, <coughs> can be traced pretty, pretty directly to uh, the attitudes of the terrorists. Oh, uh, oh, okay. So the, you know, a lot of my optimism is that uh, yeah. if, <coughs> if you had this economic common purpose, I, I mentioned the... Uh, Woodrow Wilson, after World War I, but in uh, 1953, Mo Sadiq was uh, on the cover of Time magazine. He was described by some as the George Washington of Iran. Ah. <coughs> and the yeah. Dulles brothers, John Foster, Dulles, him, yeah. uh, CIA Secretary of State, they yeah. sent Kermit Roosevelt over with a big bag of money and he provoked enough riots and Kept, it wasn't easy, but he kept with it, did a, did a good job in that sense. That uh, still resonates tremendously in the mind and the conscience of the Middle East and that part of the world, I it, think, don't it's you? It's part of the education of young Iranians. Why, why wouldn't it be? Well, uh, then some people would say, well, that's just the operation of the capitalist system and the imperialists who are going to take over and run roughshod over the people of the world like they did during the colonial period. Well, Brought so some progress, roads and whatnot. You're right, but and that that's, it was that's imperial. a legi legitimate reaction. Mm -hmm. the, the Iranians that's not what Mr. Fukuyama was saying? Hmm. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. But the, uh, <coughs> the Iranians, Mossadegh was kicking out the British, and he even offered them the same split of the oil revenues that we had, with, the Americans had with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. They turned them down, and mm -hmm. somehow they talked us into going in there and getting rid of Mossadegh, who wow. ended up with a sham trial and house arrest for the rest of his life from the yeah. puppet uh, dictator that so I'm Shah went back. So the yeah, I'm trying everything to get that's going yeah. on in the Middle East mm -hmm. <coughs> can be traced back to that type of event. And if you said it, it's, this was at the same time that we were doing a very proud thing known as the Marshall Plan. So we were helping our yeah. enemies, Germany and Japan. Yeah, it was a good idea. Back if yeah. a little bit of that economic common purpose in helping a colonized country who had been, mm, had right. been raped for decades right. in terms of their, their own oil revenues, uh -huh. if, if we had partnered with them in a commercial way at that time, uh, where have we partnered with somebody in a commercial way? Canada or Denmark or Europe or, or the Marshall Plan was. There's yeah. examples of that. We, by the United States of America, um, that sort of thing. But what have been the major well, I think things the that in a way that benefits the whole of the society? A lot of people will say, even here, we're going to do a program with Mr. Uchatel today about downsizing. And there's a lot of people who think that the system that's in place now, just we have about 20%, maybe 10, 20% of the population, as always they have, doing very well, doing very well. Gated communities are doing well. But that the system in place is in, the Marxists used to tell inherent contradictions. And they said inherent contradictions, that the system that is in place that we say Tar uh, heralds the end of history, that it has inherent contradictions and it will not ever be able to serve the interests of the 80% the of the population that is not served well by it. Now, there are people who see the world that way. You don't, apparently. Not at all. Okay. As, as okay. we've been discussing, uh -huh. <coughs> there is a system yeah. that creates more wealth, distributes it broadly, and as the countries join together in economic common purpose, you can stop the violence. I think uh, there are plenty of demonstrations that as the standard of living goes up, the violence goes down. I think it's not without a question. I think that's where it is. And, and, and I, that, that system that could be there is called democratic capitalism. Yes. In a very real, and the hallmarks of it, and the, uh, the trends there. And you wrote the, when did the book come out? 2004. 2004. 
the trends what is your sense you've been at this for a long time you've been following this issue for a long time using it in your management practice in terms of you're doing that i congratulate you on all that well led life seriously and then what is your sense about the trends as far as the economic and political evolving of things on this planet at this very crucial moment the evolution <coughs> of universal consciousness well we have an ownership society already you think we do okay with uh -huh. the with the pension money, the trillions of dollars of pension money mm -hmm. is an intolerable contradiction that those owners of the system are not now receiving the, receiving the rewards of capitalism, mm -hmm. and that has to be fixed. But the information age uh, <coughs> can only function with a democratic capitalist work culture. Mm -hmm. That's how you get the cognitive power of the people released. So I think. These things, I think we're very close, but... Uh, <coughs> You're not bothered by the problem of the, um, Mr. Keynes' warning, technological displacement of labor. We can always have something that people will do, will get some value well, they added and they so said forth. How, what, how, no. how could that <coughs> be true if you look at the United States today with 4% unemployment and, and less than 10% well, the in, pharaohs the labor, had full in the labor? The, fa the, pharaohs had, the pharaohs had full employment in building those pyramids of dragging stones across the hot desert. <coughs> you can get employment. There's en endless yeah. numbers of things. You can, in, in, you know, you have, to, you have to point all the buildings in the world. You can, get employ you can make employment and make things so that it grows and everything, but it isn't necessarily that there are things that are the displacement of labor thing and the input mix between labor on one hand and everything else, including capital assets and technology and everything else, and that we don't need to democratize ownership of that other than labor aspect. They've got their ability to sell their labor, but they're not doing well selling their labor now. The trends are not good. Mr. Unchatel will be talking about that later today. That the system in place, we're going to have to have a more democratizing access to capital credit in a way so that people can in be invested in the productive, uh, the future, the investment in a in, a, in, in, in something that is going to pay for itself out of its future earnings, tap into future earnings for the mass of the people, bring them in on the logic of business finance as a way of distributing income and buying power so that there will be people able to buy it. And by using it only through the labor process, you don't think that's a, pro a problem? Sure. Okay. But and how do we address <laughs> it? We have oh. ownership distribution. Ownership. But, okay. But right now. Capital ownership. Yes. Okay. But there's capital ownership right now, mm -hmm. trillions of dollars of it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's static money. W w okay. And and one of my <coughs> pet solutions. Yes. Is if if you had a capital wage made up of large dividends <coughs> to the owners of capital, mm -hmm. you'd be instead of the uh, Wall Street favorite of stock buybacks and and takeovers, yeah. you'd be returning hundreds of billions of dollars a year to the folks, to the folks and to the economy, uh -huh. which would be a huge stimulant. Now, why to aren't they? Growth. Why aren't they fu functioning? Why isn't it functioning, irrigating the economy that way now? Because ultra capitalism. Ultra capitalism, which I define as a combination of old-fashioned mercantilism, which treats the worker as a disposable cost commodity yes sure. and mm. a finance capitalism that according to Smith is mm. supposed to be supportive of the job growth economy uh -huh. neutral money etc uh -huh. is dominant okay and they write the rules <coughs> they don't like dividends mm -hmm. they prefer the cash be kept as an attraction for a takeover or used as a takeover retain so earnings the they dividends have gone Dividends used to be 50% of the return of uh, capitalism. When? In the, the 60 years prior to a recent. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and stock used to be held six years, uh -huh. just like Warren Buffett would prefer. Some patient And cash. it's now traded every year. Yeah, right, right. Brokers' commissions are up. The uh, mutual funds charge at least 1.5% annually uh -huh, uh -huh. for handling the pensioners' money. Uh -huh. <coughs> and Jack Bogle writes books, including a new one. I want you say you're going to put me on to him. I appreciate that. His, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And his, his book points out that, <coughs> and there are other books on the same subject that uh, demonstrate the same thing, that you can get 
equivalent or better performance from index funds at one tenth of the cost. If you multiply that out, that's another 80 or 90 billion dollars a year. That's uh, again what Ev Dirksen would call real money. Real money. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, uh -huh. <laughs> the, the problem, I, th I think, is that the, the people that you mentioned, the one that would, would immediately respond to uh, the title of my book mm -hmm. and say, isn't that an oxymoron? And I would say, don't you have time to study the conflicts in capitalism? Because if you just continue yeah. Yeah. with this attitude about uh. generic capitalism yeah, right. and do not do the study, you're going to leave a policy vacuum that's going to be very happily Thank you. filled by Wall Street as they have before. Just yeah. sort of give us an example. Malfactors uh, of great wealth. Yeah. We've we only got a couple minutes left. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, that's good. And well, it's look, like a big tent, capitalism. And there's a lot of different ways it can be seen and it can be structured, a lot of variables in that. And what you suggest is we should be thinking about some that favor this idea of democratic capitalism, we, which is in keeping with Mr. Mill and Mr. Smith. We've got a limited so time. I've I got yeah, only got a other, minute or two left. Yeah. I've got to get my other solutions in. Okay, quick. You've got to do use haiku, like I say. You've got to go <laughs> quick, yeah? One is the, the maximum dividends, capital wage, and preferably tax free for low and middle income people. Uh -huh. that, that would do a tremendous job. Mm -hmm. The institutional investors could start tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock or whatever time they go to work measuring companies on sales growth, cash flow, and profits against management predictions. That sounds too simplistic, but that would immediately shift the economy away from the short term and greedy back to the long term. As a matter of fact, the cash flow. We need that patient capital. Yeah, right. the, ca right. the cash flow protocol right. would have prevented most of the damage at Enron. You think so? Yeah, okay. Yeah. The, the last one is that the government has to begin to prevent asset inflation, the real estate and stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh, we had the example of the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Greenspan, going to Congress and saying they couldn't have prevented the 1990 bubble. Uh, mm. Which I think is nonsense. You mm. got you got brokers' margins. You got uh, bankers' reserves. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you've got taxes, and I I thought I was all alone on that idea that the government uh, handles price inflation because that affects the wealthy, mm -hmm. but they they won't touch asset inflation. But I now discovered that there was a paper written at the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, in Basel, Switzerland, last year on just that subject, is well, okay. stability enough. Well, is there, and these things and many, many more, uh, the basic grounding philosophy, which is very important and so forth, and also a number of the practical applications that could be considered by people in positions of concern for the operation of our economy and the society are found in the book. Uh, happy to have been able to let you see what it looks like in the bookstores. It can be available, I guess it's available on Amazon and yes. so forth. And it's called Democratic Capitalism, subtitled again, Mr. Carey. The way to a way, the way to a world of peace and plenty. Okay, if you <laughs> want a world of peace and plenty, this is the way, and it's not a bad idea right at the get side. So thanks a lot, Ray. It's a great Thank pleasure you, talking to you. Enjoy Your pleasure to have your perception. We're coming back again tomorrow. That's it for now, but one more time. It's really a good book. I got a chance to read a lot of it. I got more to read, and I will, and I look forward to being continued for me.